is uh, he's a New England guy. Uh, played at Boston College, but we're now. Did you play with now? No. You didn't. God bless you. But you, you GA for him, did you? Yeah, that's a shame. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and Paul, there's a lot of New England guys here today. Uh, and uh, he's been uh, just about more places than, 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 than Cotter has a little of those. But he uh, coached up in Dartmouth, he coached at Maine in the Naval Academy. And then he uh, went to Edmonton, I believe, where they won like two million breakups up there. And then he got his first job with the New Orleans Saints, okay, where he had uh, uh, real good playoff team, good players, a good solid uh, foundation down there with the Saints. They did a real nice job of running the ball. And uh, then he went from the New Orleans Saints and he went up to the uh, Detroit Lions and he coached this little guy named Barry Sanders to about 18, 1900 yards, which wasn't bad. I don't know if they blocked anybody with the son of Judge Raymond that block. Okay? And now he's with the New England Patriots. He's in his hometown. He grew up there. So it's a lot of fun for him to go back there and coach. And I've known him for about 20 years. Okay? You're going to get some really good information. He's going to talk about uh, the power play the tight ends don't want to block. Which is if you guys have a few of those. He's going to talk about a turn protection and a, and a, and a screen off the turn protection. He's going to talk about the stretch play. And he's going to have the pass set drills for different pass set techniques. And you got two hours. Now we're going to be here for two hours. We're going to get a ten minute break, and then we're going to go over another two hours. And you're going to have dinner, and then we're going to come back, and you're going to finish up the night with McNally. We'll see how many of you die hot on the guns are going to be left here. Now Paul Woodrow and the one with Patriots. Thanks a lot, Bob. All right, a couple of things before we get started. Uh, is McNally here? McNally's not here. He's probably doing a clinic someplace else. How many years has this clinic been on? 15 years. McNally was in, with it for 15 years. Never did McNally have his picture on the brochure. Now, be a hell of a lot more guys here if you didn't put your picture on this brochure. <laughs> but. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and share some of the stuff. And let me just say flat out that uh, some of you guys that know me, I don't have all the answers. And uh, the, the, the point I'm going to bring up is uh, we've, we've had real good running backs. And some of these players we're talking about, we've had real good running backs where I've been. We had Dalton Hilliard and Ruben Mays down in New Orleans who, who ran the ball you know, pretty well for us. And uh, we had Barry up in the, Detroit, we really didn't have to block for him, and I got felt to prove it. And we had uh, Curtis uh, Martin, who uh, played for us, and he had 1,180 yards rushing prior to his injury. In the last five games, we didn't have a 100-yard rushing game after he got hurt. So what I'm saying is, what you see up here, I don't have the answers, and you have to be blessed. And, and just to prove a point, and, and everybody made such a big deal out of the Denver Broncos not having a guy over 300 pounds in their offensive line. And, and Alex Gibbs does a great job coaching those guys, and they do a hell of a job coming off the ball. But uh, Pat was here, and I think the Monday night game, last game of the season, uh, Terrell was out, and I think what they have, 18 yards rushing against you. And then uh, Tom Levac was going to speak. Uh, was at the Super Bowl and, and Terrell had a migraine headache in the second quarter and they got zero yards rushing. So the guy told the mail does have a lot to do with it. And what, what we try to do up front is to try to make sense and have a starting point so you, when your guys have a chance to do the right thing, they can see it after you put it in. They can see it working on film. And if it doesn't work, you know, where do you go from there? And, and that's kind of what, what I'm going to talk about today. We, uh, I think, and everybody in this room at one time has, has run a stretch play or a slant play. Or, I, you know, I don't know what you might call it, but you know, why, why run the stretch play and the slant play? Well, the first thing was for us, going back to New Orleans and with Barry, especially at Detroit, a lot of people will two-gap a great runner so they can't cut back. 
We were blessed in New Orleans to have, uh, at uh, New England, to have Curtis Martin, who was a similar style runner as Barry. He wasn't like Barry, but he, he was similar in, in the fact that most of his big runs were by reading something and hitting it and cutting it back. And the stretch play for a line coach is good because it gives you guys a chance to just come off the ball. There's no really thinking. You know, you take your proper approach, you, uh, you, you get your landmarks, and you come off the ball. And it's a no-brainer. You tell you guys, here's your chance to just come off the ball. The problems that we have had in, in uh, running the stretch play, yeah, we really had to go to a different kind of a blocking scheme. All right, the problems was, first of all, the defense uh, that does a lot of line stunts. They run ETs and TEs. They kind of mess up your zone angles. Uh, you heard guys talk about it, about taking a settled step and reading it and letting guys get on people. And that was good if you have draw plays, brush plays, whatever you call it. When you want to try to hit it, it was hard for us to take a settled step, read this whole pile, and move it. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, we found was people stopped just playing regular vanilla defense. They started to overshade linebackers. They bossed the linebackers strong, or they get a nose and a tilt technique that you couldn't reach anymore. A three technique on your guard got to be a gap three. A five technique got to be a loose five or a gap five, and a nine was an unreachable deal. So the stretch play, for all the good things you had, it became a problem when people started to just overplay by alignment, okay? And that's why we had to go to another blocking scheme. Uh, the defensive players are just better than your guys. You know, I mean, I got a guard, he's trying to block Warren Sapp, and he can't block Warren Sapp. I got a tight end, can't block Reggie White, okay? So now, what are you gonna say? Well, block him. Well, bullshit on that. I mean, he's better than me. I can't block him. So you had to go to another scheme. But you didn't want to give up the fact that you wanted to attack the perimeter and get to a stretch. The running back rules were simple for us. Okay? Uh, if you're, you had a fullback in the backfield, we did a bunch of little different things, and you'll see it on the tape. We had the fullback lead and block number four. We had the fullback divide and block the end middle line of scrimmage and swipe. Okay? If, if you got a, a safety involved where you couldn't get a, a, a receiver in that position to crack him, we assigned the fullback to him. And that was a game plan thing. It was a week-to-week -week kind of a deal. The running back, his heels are at seven yards. Now, if you look at some of this film, you know, sometimes they cheat a little bit. Uh, some of the, you know, quicker guys like Barry, they have a little trouble keeping them at seven sometimes. Uh, his first landmark was the landmark. Now the first thing he's thinking is inside leg of the tight end. On his, at the snap of the ball, that landmark changes. And what our running back coach calls it is a one in three landmark. He's, he's really thinking uh, one yard outside the tight end at the second step. And he's really looking for three feet behind the tight end. So he is looking to see if the tight end has got a stalemate, which you saw Pat was talking about, where you take the guy and run him down the line of scrimmage and turn him out. He's looking for a guy pinching inside, and he's really looking for a chance to cut the ball back. Stretch only goes outside for us. The way we teach it is if they let you. We tell our running back is, you're basically going on your second step, you're looking for a window. So how does that affect the rest of your blockers, okay? And that, that's something I just want to touch on right now. What happens is this. We'll go with an, uh, sorry, we'll go with an over defense first. And it could be a seven technique, it could be a nine technique. But his landmark is right about there. Okay, his first eyes are looking at inside leg, and then his second step, that thing's going to widen, so that's where his landmark is. Whether it's a hook or a stretch, his landmark's going to be at the one and three. All right, now, if you got him off the ball, you're going to chase that leg, and you're going to go until you see a window. And when you see that window, you're going to take it up the field. Now, here's the problem that happens. 
And sometimes head coaches and sometimes offensive coordinators don't understand the problems that we have. All right? If the guy makes you cut up inside and the defensive lineman makes a hit on the back and he tackles you for a three-yard gain, the first thing they usually say is, don't reach so far, cover up more of the guy, and that way we will be able to go ahead and break it up inside. But then that's great until the first time you can't get the guy hooked and he forces you right now to come up the field and cut it in the backfield. We don't want to make a cut until we get to the line of scrimmage. Now you see Barry do that, most of the time it's because we missed, okay? If you get to the line of scrimmage, most of your north-south cuts are on the line of scrimmage. You chase the leg and you go and make that cut. And if the guy, you know, we got a new coordinator, he's been around forever, and he just says, why can't you just say, block the nearest guy and kick the shit out of him? You know, well, it, sometimes you gotta give him a point of, a, well, where do you want me to block? You want me to go for his outside number, you want me to go for his inside six inches. So we don't target with our head. Okay, a couple years back you guys all had memos and take the head out of football, get it out of your playbook, lawsuit, and all that kind of stuff. And what I did was, because of what I learned from Jimmy a long time ago with pass protection, everything was steps, one, two, three, kick, slide, post, and all that. I started to target with my feet. And that's the best thing I probably have done. When you tell a tight end, when you tell a guard, when you tell a center or tell, tell a guy to block a three technique, where is your landmark? And a long time ago I learned that you probably never make contact on your first step. So when I take a step, whether it's a gap step, a lead gap step, or a drop or a bucket step, I probably am never hitting a guy on my first step. My second step's where I get the contact. You saw Pat do that drill where they were doing the flipper and then the flipper with the step. Well, that's about how natural it becomes. So if I told a guy, if I'm gonna drive reach the guy on the slant play, and I told my tight end, okay, your second step goes to his crotch. Okay, if I take a step, whether it's a bucket or a gap, my second step's to his crotch. That's about the angle you want your shoulders and that's about where you tell them where your head wants to be. The other thing it does for me is it reinforces, okay, them keeping a base. So if I do this on boards and we do our tight ends, and see back, way back in Detroit now, we wear three wides, Tom Moore's our coordinator there. We wear three wides, our head coach says, I want to wear three wides, goal line, short yards, I don't give a shit. We got Brett Perryman, we got Johnny Moore, we got Herman Moore. Our tight end wanted to see the ball. So one off season, we just said, you ain't gonna see the ball. You're gonna learn how to be an offensive lineman. And from pass protection to run blocks, they stayed with me in the off season, twice a, day, uh, twice a week, throughout the whole season, and they learned how to be tackles. And it be, we became better blockers on the edge because they understood the problems. And, they, and, and we told the head coach, Quarterback can't throw the ball in the offseason to the tight ends on Tuesday and Thursday. That was it. They were lining. And they had a better understanding of what we're trying to teach. So if I told a guy, you've got six inches outside his number, well, sometimes his steps, if they're not disciplined, might be here. He might be a little wide here. So I just started targeting feet. If I was going to go with a straight drive block, my second step is to his inside shoe. Now you might want to take that settle step or gap step, but the second step is to his inside shoe. Yeah, it works, Pat. That's, pretty good. That's it. And if you're going to go ahead and inside lead and cut off, my second step is to his crotch. So the buzz technique that Bob was talking about with the tackle in the tight end working is you target his feet. He's in his stance, he sees the defensive lineman's feet, so now I know I have to get my second step. Is that the right angle with his shoulders? Is that the right head placement? He usually winds up that way. If that guy moves and he's slanted across my face, at least my hips are open and they're locked that I can run him down the line of scrimmage. I got a wide nine technique, okay? You got help from your tackle, okay? My second step is to his outside shoot. If you're gonna go ahead and easy combo that thing and go a little wider, 
You target your feet. Now, the key thing is the third step is where you get your drive. Get it up the field. And how I learned that is I listened to Ray Hamilton tell the defensive lineman when they pass rush, when they get there, their second step's got to clear the hip and to get through. So I figured that's the same thing when you drive block. If you open here, your second step here. So I can get this guy up the field. My third step's got to clear his hip. If I'm an uncovered lineman and I'm working to my linebacker, and I'm going to help my tackle on the right guard or center on a 4-3 defense. Okay, we talked about this. Your second steps to the linebacker shoe, you put the stop sign here, but how do you take care of the gray area? You bring your third step up and you exaggerate. So an easy drill for that is you get a board, you get a line, you put their hand down, you take their steps, and you film this. Their second steps got to touch the line, the third steps got to be across the line, and then they're running that zone in. So when we target, we take any reference of head out of the drill, okay, and put it in the feet, and the feet, I'm telling them, just cover the cylinder. If you got help from your inside guy, whether you use your flipper or a two-hand press, your second steps to his crotch because your buddy is going to cover you up or overlap. So that's how we teach the zones, and it just it goes back to the footwork of the same thing as kick, slide, post. You just put in the same terms in the running game. All right, on this block, so if we have a window here, okay, I got a reachable three technique. My guard's going to take a flat gap step. The wider he is, the deeper his bucket. If he's in a reachable, he can step flat. If he's head up playing like a two, he can go ahead and lead step. But his second step has got to be to his crotch. And we are going to run a track, and we're telling him, if he hangs on your outside arm, and that back cuts it back, that's the back's problem. And we used to say we paid Barry a lot of money to break them tackles. What's going to happen is, we're telling the guys to move the down guys, and let the running back, uh, the running back move the linebackers. Run your path, and if you get any kind of movement and you make him run a hump, you got a chance for a four-yard play. The problem that we have, they go on defense, they start playing this in an over defense. They take the Mike linebacker, they widen the three, they put this guy in a seven or a nine, the buck, so the San Francisco guys, we do the same thing, we got a San Francisco defensive coordinator, and they put the plugger like that stacked. Now you get into a situation where this guy going through has a hard time on him. Your tight end and tackle really don't work together as much as your guard in practice time, at least for us. We don't get a lot of time to work with our tight ends. So their relationship is not great. So sometimes Ben might come off too soon and hang my tackle out to drop. And you get that guy coming over the top, and you got to go get that buck linebacker, but you bail on your tackle. Now you're forcing this thing back to the three technique, and the three technique becomes an unreachable guy. I asked a question last night when we get together as a group, when you're running the inside zone play, the ET stunt bothers me because you get all that same problem, but you're running the hole a little bit tighter. So when we ran the stretch play, if you play two gap, like the Giants, like the Jets, use the Giants used to the Jets, and you got Pepper Rogers in a three-four defense, and he Pepper, you know, and he's up there, Pepper Johnson, he's up there, he's two and a half yards off the ball, and he's playing like a three technique. Yeah, it's easy to get up on him and just run those guys. But when they start to come over the top and scrape and then hang on the three and then kind of backdoor you on your seven technique, what do you tell you guys? And so we came up with a play that we, we, we actually call the glass in Detroit. And it's the same landmark, and let me just go over the same deal with the, with the under defense on the stretch. You got the tilt and all his guard. You know, having Thomas plays for us, I mean, he plays this, this thing so well. They put, Minnesota plays that plugger here where this guy's letting the tackle 
get beat in the back door. Henry jumps top over the top, and you just can't get enough movement or enough hook to where that nose guard doesn't come right down the line of scrimmage and just you know, wipes out your play. Pittsburgh runs it, and it's a hard reach. You can tell your center to go flat as you can, but he just, I mean, our guy doesn't get it done. So you sit there and you say, well, we're going to keep on running the block, uh, play because we told you we're going to run this play. But if your kid can't do it, he's looking at you like you're an idiot. So what happened uh, is we went to a, a play which we call blast. And it's the same exact hookup for the quarterback and the running back. But we give these guys options. When we started doing this, and we had a regular defense, and we felt like, okay, we can reach him, we can knock these guys off the ball, and we're gonna go ahead and hang, just like all the coaches have been talking about, hang until you have to come over on the mic. And in the backside, this guy uses a slice technique, and he gets up on the plugger or goes to the safety, and that was great. But then the same problem started to happen. You know, they started to cheat their linebackers over. They bring him here. The guy's a six. He's a stack six. And we got big, big kind of problems. And then we started saying, well, we'll run the stretch play and we'll do, do a bunch of blocking calls. And like Coach said today, you know, you get in somebody's stadium, they, they're not hearing any blocking calls on the backside. The guy next to you might not hear it. So we decided that we wanted to run this play and we called it blast. And blast was the stretch with a different kind of a blocking scheme, and it was a scheme, it wasn't a zone. So what we did was this. We took and we gave them the opportunity to go ahead and block it the best way they thought they could get their job done. Which, if you give them a chance to think a little bit, and they're right, they feel good about themselves. They really didn't feel it. Just you, you make them feel like they did something smart. Here's what happened. Okay, we get in a situation where I can't reach that three technique. So the best way we, we decided to do that was to block him down. Now that leaves your tight end a little bit of a bind. But your tight end on a seven technique, if that buck linebacker is out there, he knows. When this guy comes around, he's going to give him a little bit of help. And when he gets around the corner, just like Pat was saying, well, I tell my guys, get dirty. Cut, you know, get dirty. I want you on the ground. I want you cutting. I want you working. You can't work this in practice other than the bags like what Pat does. But get down on the ground and get dirty. Cut linebackers. They're going to try to blow you up if you come around the corner and you're sitting up there nice and pretty. You cut them right through the thigh same thing with the center. The center you can't go through because that Mike linebacker is going to go over the top. So my center, anytime he feels like he has to pull, he pulls. The backside guard, he's got to know that. So by a call or by recognition, he pulls and clips the nose guard and he works a flatter scoop step. The backside tackle, he slices through and he goes for a cut. So we're looking for bodies down. We want people down because we don't know where this thing's going. But most of the time, when it's a big play for us, it hits there or sometimes behind the three technique because you already heard the tight ends have the same problem as tackles, the guys that cross your face. So the play is the same landmark. If my running back is running inside leg of the tight end, and at the second step, he's now looking a yard uh, outside the tight end and three feet behind the tight end and if he sees that tight end shoulders turn he's going up the yard. If he sees that tight end skate down line of scrimmages and, and he is going to go ahead and make that inside cut. The only real time he's staying outside is when we've got it definitely pinch or we got it all sealed off with an angle ball. I got an under defense and and the thing with the center, and I tell the guards the same thing. If you go through, you're not wrong unless you don't get your block. You can always go, we call it an if technique. You can always go through 
But if you make that decision to go through, you got to block the mic. If you don't block the mic, you're wrong. I don't want you running him and staying up high and having to make it. You've got to get into that position. You cut him or you knock him and seal him inside. If you're not sure, you always go around. And it's the same thing with the center. If it's a 4-3 defense, and here's the other reason we went to this. We played Miami three times in five weeks because of the schedule of the playoff game. And Miami does the same thing that Earl Langley teaches at Washington. Earl Langley, if you ever play against his defense, whenever he reads a scoop or a slip block, he'll probably grab two guys or grab your center's face mask, and you can't get off. You say, well, you cut the guy. When you wind up cutting the guy, you cut your guy and your center. So what happened was they were reading slip, and he's grabbing both my guys, and this guy, middle linebacker, is making plays all over the block. So he said, okay, we're not running stretch now. We're going to run blast. Center, you have the option to go through or pull around. Well, on his first step, when he pulls, it looks like slip. So the first thing that you'll see on film is their defensive tackle grabs my guard. And he's looking to grab the center, but my center keeps coming around. Now, there is a picture where we get this guy and knock his ass down. There's also a picture where this guy scrapes over the top, and we trap him, and we cut it up inside. And there's also a picture where we don't block him, and he overruns him like a blind dog in a meat house. He knows that these two guys are getting grabbed, and he's free to go. But what happened was we pulled our center and we pick it off. So here's the deal. The back is running, he's running. That guy's still making my tight end. My tight end's not a train killer. And he's gonna be like that, and he's riding, and we're trying to tell him, just like Pat tells his tight ends, turn him to the outside if he can. But we're telling that running back is once you're on the third step, you see that thing flat, you go right now. And it goes back to the Mike's block. So the same thing holds true here. We're gonna use the Shannon Sharp cross shoulder reverse, leg whip, whatever you want to call it. We're going to use that down and the same thing when we're going to tell the tight end, we tell the tackle on the down block. Some guys get heavy in their stance, some guys get a big stack. Those are the guys that Bob were talking, was talking about that they step within themselves. So how do I correct that? If a guy's going to be stepping within himself, the first thing I do is I tell him, just get in your stance and just, just six inches, roll it on your outside cheek. Load up your right cheek. Now you wait to your right cheek. I should be able to open and step. If you've got, you've got a guy who's really stacked and has a lot of weight here, the only way he can step is by stepping within himself. That's number one. The other thing is, if the guy's got a big stagger and he can't do that with his hips, I just tell him, bunch up a little bit, get a little bit more parallel, which allows you to open it up. But when we do that drill, we always do it on a board. Because my second step is what I'm teaching. The first step is to open your hips and unlock your power. Your second step is here to close off the guy from coming over the top. So instead of saying, go for his ear hole, his near shoulder, I'm telling him to take his second step and have him step to the defensive lineman's feet. Now, I've closed off the penetrator and I've kept the guy from coming over the top. It also forces him to make contact on the second step. So instead of doing this, there's his ear hole, and you've crossed over, you've got a problem with the guy that comes up and spins. So if you just track him and say on your second step, it's like you're running down a board. Okay, you closed off the guy from being a penetrator, but you've kept him from coming over the top. So the tight end and the tackle are the same cover. So when the tight ends and tackles work together and they're working this blocking scheme, okay, they're both being told to do the same thing. So it's easy to teach them. So when you've got those guys in the offseason, they know. Okay, we're gonna take a gap step inside, settle step, second step, get up the field with your second step made contact. So now your tight ends and tackles are being taught like alignment. 
The other thing to tell him is, if you go through, just like the center, you better get him blocked. But if you come around, we'd like you to go ahead and knock his outside thigh. Go right through his thigh. The only time that you're going to probably stay high on the guy is if the guy's to the point where he's head up to outside of you, then you've got to run him just like the tight end runs the nine technique out. The right tackle on the front side. His point is he's going to pull and he's trying to hook the buck. If the buck widens, just like a tight end takes and opens up and that guy winds, he runs that line of scrimmage and he, with a strong inside arm, tries to turn that guy to the boundary. I tell him to turn your shoulders to the boundary and make sure the guy is with you. But inside arm is strong. If the guy comes and squeezes it right now with a down block, it's a log, it's a no brain. In your second step, it's a hook. The guy that comes up the field, it's a kick out and it's a trap. You just run him flat, your head's inside. So as you step, on your first step, it's either going to be a kick out because the guy's a penetrator, or the guy starts to skate outside, you just keep running and hook. All right? Now, just like Pat said before, this block here usually wipes out the nose guard in your center. So the center has to be aware that, hey, as you're running down line scrimmage, and we tell him, the, the more he's got to tilt, the deeper you got to go. Your second step's got to get to his outside shoe, and if you go ahead and rip him, rip him, and run him down the line of scrimmage. The guy I had in Detroit, Glover, was real good at having a feel of running and dropping. If you watch film on Denver, they got a guy that does the same thing. Nailing, he has a good feel for running a guy and dropping. Some guys don't have that feel. Some guys try to cut right now. I just tell them to run until you fall down, or if you get position upfield, to drop it. On the back side, same thing. We're slicing, we're chasing, and we're trying to cut. And what we're telling him is if you can cut him down and he overruns this play, there's the land. Because the five technique, if he runs outside, we're going to try to hit the BB. And sometimes if you see this and you have a running back that has a good feel for him, he'll cut it back to the A-gap, which is sometimes behind the nose guard. So blast for us was a better way versus better people in different alignments. At Detroit, like I said before, with Tom, we ran out of single back. We ran a lot of trip stuff. And the thing that happened to us was we were cracking, and we did this at New England as well last year. We were cracking. But what happens on that is, if this guy steps up, we had a guy here, so we would double crack, and we always run without the corner being blocked. Because in the National Football League, some of the worst tacklers are corners, and some of the best tacklers are safeties. So we would try to double crack linebacker safety levels and let the corner go, figuring, okay, that if the nine technique was not going to allow you outside, it would never go to the corner anyways. So we had the guard on the run through, we had the receiver on the scrape. If the guard's guy disappears over the top, he went to the backside linebacker, and we would just fold, cut this, and let the end go. So blast, instead of stretch where everybody was reaching and running, okay, blast was, okay, we do have an unblocked guy on the backside, and if he does decide to chase, we felt that blast was going to be a, a really a wider belt. And that's what it was for us in New England last year. And I'm not a big stat guy, defensive guys like stats, but we did have one where we had 4.7 going left, and I think 6.2 going right, and we probably should have called it more to get our average down. But we, we basically knew how to run this play. Our running back, when he got hurt, the backup guys knew how to run this play. And it's good to always have a play that you can hang your hat on, but if the guy gets hurt and the next guy can't run it, where do you go? But all our running backs and our tight ends, they had a better feel. They, our guy would much rather block down on a five technique than reach a guy that's on his head. So it helped the scheme. You didn't have a killer, train killer as a tight end blocking, but on the seven technique, he always knew he had help coming around, whether it be the tackle or it be the guard. 
And sometimes, and you'll see one snap of this on film, the center, when he came around, trips over the tight end's guy. And we never got to the linebacker, but it was enough to keep the guy from penetrating and getting up the yard. So that was a big uh, play for us. And we really basically had a problem with the this, with this stretch play, the slant play, or whatever you want to call it. And it was, it was something that we could continue to run because we liked running it, and it gave us a chance. All right. The other thing that we did on the stretch play versus the blast, we were big on tight end motion, and we motioned a little bit up in control. But our tight end motion, our tight end's a big tall guy, and, and when he came across in motion, it was hard for him to come and dig a guy out. So the best thing we did, and a lot of people in the league do it, it's no big uh, mystery, is when we got across in motion, he kind of gathers himself and gets himself in this position square to the line. And the thing that I liked about it was when we had a guy who gave him a hard inside ch charge, we were square to the line of scrimmage and we were able to pin a guy. Sometimes your tight ends come across in motion and he and the quarterback are on safe and he's a little wider than he wants to be or he isn't there fast enough and he wants to have a trap a guy or he has to come back on a guy. When a guy comes across in motion, he's swear to the line of scrimmage. He knows where he has to be to get that guy blocked either on a drive reach or if he's comboing with his tack. The other thing that we did that when people started to see us with our Y off and they, they knew motion was coming across, we would line up, shift off the ball, we would motion across, shift back up. So instead of always motioning, we would make our shift look like a motion. Some people, if you train a tight end and they're an under team, seven guys move and they're playing the defense they want. And what we started to do was, when we had teams like that, we just decided to get on the ball, motion across, shift up. Now they've got to play the defense and the coverage call and not get to what, you know, they went from an over to an under or an under to an over. So we, we started doing that, and that helped our tight end because he was on the move, but he was square to the line of scrimmage, and his margin of error was better because when he was working with the tackle, they were working at that kind of an angle instead of coming down the line of scrimmage like that. So that their footwork was a lot better when we squared up our motion. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just, just show you a little bit of the slant, of the stretch play, and the blast, and then we'll go on to the, the, the play of the day, I guess, has been power. The power with the tight end that doesn't like the ball. Stretch and uh, it was six yards. Here's here's a two gap team. Uh, we shifted our tight end across. We're going to just get cheek to cheek, belly to belly, and just come off the ball. This was a guy that we worried about. We, we said we didn't care about corners sometimes. These two guys were going to change assignments. He was in a crack. Help us on Molos, who was a bitch. We didn't dig our tight end. Had a good chance, and as you can see, he's laid off the ball. But he is trying to stretch. His second step has got to go upfield, and he's going to reach, and that puts his head where he wants to be because he knows he's got help from his tackle. Here we got the fullback going on the corner, and we wind up with six. Again, we shifted over. We wanted to run it at 58. They were in 3 4 personnel. Again, Here's what happens, you get in a situation where this guy starts to grab you. My center here is trying to get that off arm free so he doesn't get it grabbed. And just run pepper by, stay on him, 
and run to the right. Same thing here. Run this guy by, and now it's definitely going outside because that was designed to go outside because we were cracking. Here it is again. Uh, we call it slot tax formation. He's going to go ahead. You got a nine technique. You got a wide five. Now we said to the center, you can have. You, you're going to go ahead easy with these two. But if you go through, give your guard a call because this guy here, we felt we'd be quick hook. And if he wasn't going to get help, we're not going to go so flat to make that linebacker be a problem. Again, second step has got to come to his crotch, line him just like Pat said. Once you get him to that point, go ahead and run by the hole. Now let the corner go and practice safety because that's the guy that's going to be a good tackle. Fumble balls out. Okay. Again, the stretch point. You got a 3 4 defense. And Spielman, we had to slow it down a little bit because being at Detroit, Spielman would be like Sam Mills. He reads things so well that he would take a chance and go underneath when he wasn't supposed to and make a big play. So my guard, his second step, he is thinking take over the end, but he's really thinking about this week. Spielman is such a good guy. Reed, go ahead and go under. You know, we had Spielman, we had both guys. In this case, it didn't spill, but we, we were slowing him up for that reason. It's kind of like what Jimmy was talking about and, and Bob Wiley was talking about that guy coming down so hard. We were worried about this guy coming underneath. So instead of burying your head, you go two hands here. Slow yourself up here for that guy. And there's the window. All right, it looks like he should stay outside. It looks like my tackle's in great position. Stay out here, stay out here. But what we tell him on this play is, that is a good relationship. But here's where you're going to go and get the money, right there. Hit the window. So what our running back coach tells him is, okay, your first step is here. Your second step now, you're looking right for that spot. Now, if his shoulders are to the boundary or he's square and stretched, you press that until you get to a point where you can make that cut. The only time he really stays outside is if that guy goes down and then we triple slip it with the tight end up on the linebackers. But there's, there's what we're saying. See, he doesn't make that cut until he gets to the feet of the line. And he's pressing it. And it, this is fine. You know, and everybody says, well, you should have been blocking it. Maybe you should get your inside hand. Fuck, if he makes that tackle for four, great. But what do you want? You want to hook him or you want to block him? If you block him straight up, it's a different play. It's a bounce. Here's, here's, here's how he gets square. He gets himself in a position that if he was early, he could be in a position like a wide off. And those two guys on the relationship of the combo would be just about where it is. You don't come off until that linebacker gets stacked outside. Right tackle, he's thinking bench the outside number. I'm going to get help. My tight end's coming across, but i got to get this outside arm and press right there. Now, he's torquing, which a lot of the coaches talked about not doing it. We don't want him to torque right now. We want him, if he's going to torque anybody, torque them to the outside. Stay on that path right there. See this tight this guard? He's kind of doing what he's supposed to do. Now, this guy, so to say, he looks like his whole body's on my head right here. But he's stiff as hell. I mean, he's trying to do. He's trying to do what we tell him to do. Stay on that path. Stay on that relationship. Let him hang on the backside. And if, if Curtis were to cut it here, that's fine. He'll make the tackle. That's fine. But at least you don't have the guy getting you a two-way go. On the backside, try to go ahead and, and get down. Uh, he's reading it. He sees the run through, and he's turning back on him. But don't get lazy. If you can cut him, cut him. Okay, now here's the problems that happen on the stretch. Now, minus two. All right, now you get a situation where, okay, I got a three technique that it's hard to reach. This seven technique now is in that gray area. 
okay, when do I come off on my linebacker, when do I hang with my tackle? And then what happens is my tackle is dead. He's dead. Now, the tight end with that seven technique, he should be inside lead step. But what happened is, I think you'll see from the end zone, he kind of circles his feet. His second step is, see, once he does that, he's bailed on his tackle and he's dead. So there's a problem for us. If he takes an inside lead step, which he should do, even though we're working a combo, they'll stay tighter together. But just naturally, he thinks he's supposed to come off. So what does he do? He crosses over. That's a tough reach. And he's getting his second step to his outside, to his crotch, to outside leg, right there. That's what I want him to do. If that guy hangs on it, hangs on it, there's the window. Take it inside. But there's a problem that it happened because of the seven technique. Another problem is you've got a nose guard. I think this is the one. Okay, now you've got the nose guard down. But now these guys are just hanging, two gapping, two gapping, and you've got a back that doesn't look for the window. So if you start to run the blast play and you bring them down and you bring them around, there becomes a window in here. Right there, there's the window. That's where we want them to be. All right, but he kind of motors down and he's stretching it. And, but this is what we want him to do. This is why I call him get, get down and get cut. Cut, cut. Now, you get into a situation where you're going to try to run that path, and that's your linebacker and the front side guard. You just read that and keep coming, bring them to the window. Stretch again. Okay, they're straightening us out. And again, your back needs to run this over and over and over again because it's just not a one-time play where they're going to automatically get the feel. Here's a, here's a good example of a tackle trying to torque. His initial steps are good, and then he tries to just up the body. And if he just stays on that path, you've got a chance. They're working up to this guy here. Okay, bad angle by the tight end. So, so what happens is if these guys are really good players and they're flagging you out, you don't have a chance. So we went to the blast. Here's the blast. Same hookup by the backs. Okay. Now this again, you could do this out of two backs and put him on four strong. You could divide the full back and have him swipe the backside end. Uh, you, can, you can do a, a bunch of different ways with, with number four. We were going to crack levels. There was nobody for him to crack, so he stayed on. Now here's where we go with the, with the cross shoulder reverse. And he isn't getting his legs up as good as the guys from San Francisco. But my tackle and my guard are in sync. So what my tackle does is his linebacker is already widened by a line. So he, he, and, he and the running back, or in this case the receiver, they read off. If that guy were to come underneath, my tackle kicks out the buck. If that guy comes up the field, my tackle reads off and goes to the safety. Here's an example of, uh, okay, if you could have done a better job of lifting your legs, you would have got the nose guard. And again, right through the thigh board. Now this guy's like 280 pounds, you know, and you're going to take him up high, you're going to have a hard day. There's your tackle. He's treating the safety like a linebacker. You're in a position where you can hook him, hook him, and run the path, and then force that back up in there. Same play, but instead of reaching and running, we got an angle. Okay, now, first game, they grabbed us. We couldn't get off the grab. Second game, we pulled. We were running stretch, we couldn't get off. So here's my center, he's pulling for him. All right, now, we felt like we could hook the three, we were gonna help the tight end on the seven technique, or pull. He should be pulling here. He reads that guy going outside, he comes underneath. This guy's holding up, we cut it underneath. Blind dog in the knee house, just keep going with the guys. Backside. 
kind of like Pat was saying, they think about their legs a little bit, they start to worry about it, and they aren't coming flat down the line of scrimmage using you to tackle the running back. Same play, blast, first game. Okay, now, you go through, you make that decision to go through and not pull, you better get them down. There's the down block by the tackle. Now, this tackle here is definitely afraid of getting beat up field, so he doesn't come down as hard as I like him to. But his second step has got to get to that shoe. There it is. He doesn't make contact on his first step. I'd like to have him come down a little bit harder. Second step, up field. Make contact. Now, there's the running back, okay? He sees a window. This guy's fighting out because he sees reach. He sees the linebacker. This guy's reading this triangle, the seven technique. He sees this guy, it's too late, he's pinned. That's an example of when the running back stays outside. This is like a slant for our guy. Once he's in there and he's pinned, you keep coming outside. But his point never changes. His landmark never changes. Whether we're going to zone him or we're going to blast block him, his landmark's always the same. Him and the quarterback are the same. Now here's an example of the center not getting around real clean, but still getting a piece of the middle linebacker. He's going to come around the down block of the tackle. And now there's seven techniques here, and he gets there. Now see, why did he stay outside? Well, that slant to him. Now you hang on Zach Foss's ass, which is a big ass to hang on. But right now, there it is. Stay outside. Don't block the corner. He's a better tackler than Buckley, so let Buckley try to run you out of bounds, or in this case, if you give him a little shake, maybe he'll miss you. And then you got the sideline. But instead of having this guy filling it up inside out, we let the corner go. Same deal, blast. Okay, different defense, under defense. Now you tight end, you know, he, he has an option to cross shoulder reverse or use that same technique. Second step is up the field. There's a kick out by the tap. He's going to the hook, that guy comes up the field, there's the window. So he's reading now, when we go into blast, on this look here, this is the down block, he's reading his block. Out the field, it's a kick out, hit the window. If he hangs, it's a hook, stay outside. Here's an example of this guard dog. You can get through, you better get him blocked. If you go through, you better get him blocked. Here's an example. Now, this is where a center goes too low right now from the beginning. He should have won him a little bit into this five technique. Cut. If you cut him, he doesn't make the play. Here's a great example of a guy not getting dirty on the back side. Get down on the ground, get dirty. I mean, you got a chance. We're going to run by a corner. Get his ass knocked off. If you cut his legs right there, this guy's got an open window. And if they don't like him, you practice it, and you got 10 minutes an individual, you can make them cut for 10 minutes until they're all pissed at you. Same deal. Widen this guy out. Okay, now the tackle comes around, he reads this. It's kick out. There's the window. And, and when you motion like this, now again, you can put your fullback backside if you want, but if you motion like that, that kind of clears the picture up. This tackle sees this. He can see that that's going to probably be a wide kick out. Now his head wants to be inside. Second step up the field. Now he's got to take a little bit bigger step from there. But that's a guy he don't like blocking. This guy should cut his legs. But what I'm trying to get to you guys is there's a window. Stretch, because you say stretch, don't have your running back think he has to run to the boundary. And his blast is the same way. Now, that is the lady. Flip. All right, nickel defense. Okay, nine technique. Same thing Pat was talking about. You can't reach the nine technique. We're going to open the window up here. This back, just because he sees his shoulders like that, knows where he's going. He's going here or here. Right now, on his third step, he knows he's making that cut. 
Coach, you get what's about a beer or three making a play on this, and you think he's you're gone. Like, he should go. He should go. Yeah. That's bad. There's a guy he's been around. He sees everything. He, you know, he come off. He sees a lot. He should go. That guy ain't gonna make a play. But here's the center. He's gonna pull around that down block. And he might. I'm not asking him to block him. I just want him. If, if he decides to take this window, I got a lead blocker now with my center. Again, blast. Did we play Miami? All right. Okay, same deal. Linebacker, he's going to bait me. He's going to make me go through. But I pull my center in. Kick him out. Now, here's a play that's designed to run to the inside leg of the tight end. Watch where it hits. Center traps. There's the window. But that mother back isn't in blinders, you know. He's being told, you're ready to go north-south. Same deal. Center comes around. That linebacker is going to scrape like hell this time. We're going to cover. And you, I think in this picture here, you can see him trying to grab. He's, he's trying to grab this guy so he can't get off on the scoop. If we ain't scoop, we're pulling. So there's the window. So, I mean, it's nice to say, let's get knocked off the ball, take it in. But this guy comes so hard that your guy never comes off clean enough because they're always grabbing their outside arm. So we pull. That's what we want right there. We want him thinking about his legs. He should have done the same thing. He should have cut the line back. Okay, last one more time. Okay, now we're going to just shift it over. Again, here's an example. I tell my right guard, you want to take one for the team. But right here, you should be cut. If you come around, you shouldn't be getting knocked off like this. You guys are going to run with the back and shift the motion as to who they have. Here you play side back, it was outside, back side back. Mm -hmm. This was a particular deal because of the, you know, I was at Detroit. Every time you move one guy, these linebackers bounce. So we just said he he was always going to take the guy to the outside. Now he becomes the he became strong safety. This guy became the Sam linebacker. And just because I played them so much, that's their adjustment with one man motion. When we were three wides, they always did that. Another example of a shift. Now you got a 4-2 team who wants to play an over defense to a tight end single back running team. Now you shift across like you're going to motion. You set your guy. Now they got a 5 and a 1. They're a little light over here. So now keep coming. But if you just were to trade the tight end, they slide your front and they get back to an over. <laughs> so there's the down block. He's pulling. He's reading the crack. Now he, his guy's blocked. You go to the next level. But cut him. You ain't good enough athlete to block these little piss ants out here. Cut him. That's blast, okay? All right, the next thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, you want to hit those lights there, Bobby? Please. How are we doing on time, all right? Okay. Here, here's our problem with blast. And we, we talked about it. And Ben's, Ben tries to block on his own. Run. But if Ben sees a defensive end, he don't like blocking him. And, and he's a pass catcher. And, and really, the reasons we changed our scheme is our offense coordinator last year, Larry Kennan, did this with Tom Flores up in uh, Oakland, and I think when his first year in Seattle. And it was a good change up for us because the kind of runner that we have, okay, Jimmy. When I heard him talking about the power play, everything for them was big jam and the A gap. And a lot of guys, it's a downhill, downhill. 
We couldn't get Curtis Martin to do that. As hard as we tried to do that, he bounced the thing. He always bounced it, and then what happens? You tell your guard, well, they ain't supposed to go out and get that Sam linebacker. It's just, it was a hard play for us to run, where we just jammed it. So this blocking scheme, particularly against the over defense, was pretty good for us because of the speed of our running back and the fact that we had now uh, that defense been thinking a little bit of a reach block because we weren't blocking that guy down with seven technique. We didn't have that problem that Pat was talking about. Well, okay, he's a six technique and he take that step. You know, and he said it, I think, himself. Uh, you know, they got one tight end that they don't really do that with. And, and you guys might have a tight end like that. I was, we were in New Orleans, we had Hobie. Brenner and we had John Tice and those two guys were like tackles. We could have done anything with those guys because they know how to block. And we had a guy out of Detroit, 270 pounds, named Sloan. And we told him, Tom told him, you're only going to see the ball maybe three times in four weeks. So he became a pretty good blocker. But we didn't have, we don't have that. Our, our backup tight end was out of West Virginia, Lover Cornell, and he's, he thinks he's a fast catcher and he's about 250 pounds. So, I mean, we're not talking about a guy that can blunt the guy off the ball. So that changed our scheme a little bit uh, against the bigger players. Um, and, and what we, that was the blast play. So we got, and, and what we did was on the power is we started to go ahead and power was a, uh, well, okay, it was a safe play. We we're going to block people's zone target. We we're going to block uh, angle block. You got a double team at the point of attack, and that was great. But if you keep on jamming it up in there, it was a real good play, like Jimmy ran it at Carolina. But for our guy, when he get to about that point, he'd always do that. And we're telling him, you know, 9 7 jam it, jam it. And in team, he's still bouncing. So what we started to do was this. Instead of with this, the way the guy ran the ball and, and the way they, they line up that linebacker in a couple of different spots, or they're gonna they know they're gonna spill it to the strong safety if you're not jamming it. Okay, we told the tight end, okay, anytime there is a tackle bubble, and that buck linebacker could be a lot of different spots here. You are going to easy release for secondary force. Now, it might be a linebacker in a secondary spot. Okay? If the guy's far enough off the ball, give that guy a feel like you are trying to hook him. So go ahead and brush his outside number. But arc release, easy release, and go to number four. Because there's a good chance the back's going to bounce it out there. What that did was this. We really threw a turn protection for us. Turn hot protection was real big for us. On short yardage situations, second and short, or third and, sh you know, four, three, you know, if we're going to run the ball, power was our deal. And we tried to set up a tendency here. We always ran a lot of times. We shifted our tight end, we motioned our fullback, and we snapped it right about there. And or you can get in a near backfield set. And if you get in a near tilted eye backfield set, what happens is people start to overshift line, uh, the linebackers because you're in that backfield set like that. So what we said was if you're going to shift in motion to set up a tendency for power, and power was a great statistic play for us. It was a three yard run. We were going to help ourselves in our play action pass and our turn protection by making it look like pop. The shift in the motion, the way they play their linebackers over the top, we wanted to make sure that that was how, what they were thinking on defense. When we easy released, that put our fullback, whether he was in a near backfield set or he was in motion, in a position to be square and to read the defensive end. If the defensive end widened with the tight end, he would run up track, and if they buzz the linebacker down strong, he would, they would just area block. If that defensive end didn't even move, okay, he was in a position to go ahead at an inside-out angle, where we were snapping the ball outside leg of our tackle, to go ahead and kick him out. And what usually happened was, once he took that path, 
and there was a stalemate, Curtis bounced the play. And then what we found was the guy was losing sight of the ball carrier because he was pressing the fullback so hard and he was squeezing it down because everybody runs power in the A-gap that it became a natural bounce play for us because the end, what our defensive line says, okay, once you see a flash across your face, you come down and you squeeze it like a trap. And you squeeze it and he wound up hooking himself. And so what happened was, we told him because of that, we had to go ahead and double team in the same principles that they talked about between the tight end and the tackle. You know, if the guard can gap step, can gap step, the second steps through the crotch. If the guy's a little wider, take an outside lead step to get a piece of an edge, and then you're gonna go through, and the tackle, you're blocking down, and you're gonna just push that whole pile back. But you two guys, Instead of going to the backside linebacker, you have to go to Mike. We're going to let the backside linebacker go. And occasionally, what Pat said was right, we would go ahead and slice our tight end, our tackle on the backside, and just let the end go. We felt like he wasn't going to chase the play. In the center, he basically blocked back and he tried to seal. And now the guard was thinking, I'm going to come in here until it all gets jammed. And if I have to go outside, I go outside. And Jimmy has a good point. The way they run it, he just traps anything. But they're telling their back to honk it down to him. And they, they run the shit out of it, and I think they run it great. But that wasn't our style guy. And, and so my guard can never be right. My guard's going up inside, going up inside, and the back keeps bouncing it. And the back keeps on saying to me, the reason I'm bouncing it is everything's down, and I see a big window up there. And if there was no, no window out, no, no side rails out there, we say, if the, the window's open, bounce it. And that's the way it turned out to be. Because now, if they're going to squeeze you, and they're going to force you onto the safety, at least we had a hat on the safety, and our tight end can block a safety. So that's how it evolved for us. Instead of having that guy, okay, inside of the strong bim, that wasn't going to happen. We didn't have a guy who could do that. And that was, that was the reason we went to this scheme. Now, every other time we did it, first season under, I mean, we blocked it in a traditional way. I mean, it's the same thing that uh, Pat's been talking about. And, uh, and, you know, the same deal. But by look, all he had to do is if there's a tackle bubble, I'm easy releasing and the double team starts inside, and it's going to be run, the fullback and you become a zone block guy. Versus this, for a 3-4 defense, it goes back to the old way. And it was the same problem we had. We said to him, you know, you might not be able to bounce it, but what happened was this guy started getting wide, and because of the turn protection where the guys were running that stuff all the way, we started to go ahead and kick out with our fullback. It was an easier block for a fullback because they're thinking, turn hot, turn hot, here comes the spot, run right underneath the spot, run right underneath the flat, and we got a little bit of softer look over there because that wasn't our number one play. When you have to stop the New England Patriots, you have to stop blast. You have to stop the brush because we had a guy that could run those plays well. And, and, and really, this play here was something really to help us in our protection, to give us a run-pass kind of a deal. And that's why we did it. And what if he does we were going to get 70 yards on the run because it was never going to happen the way he ran. Now, I do have a clip of him hitting the A-gap, doing it right. And he actually went back to the backside vegan. But that's the kind of guy he is. He's a vision guy. And if you ask him, and it's Tom and I who always talk about this with Barrett, and, and, and we did a little study after you get fired someplace, you always look back and you look up and see how fucked up we were and see how fucked up they were. But anytime you saw Barry in a two-back offense, and I think the first three games, they were traditionally two-backs, I think he had 47 yards in three games. He wound up in 2000 something. But he's a vision guy. You can't ask Barry to run a track. Run a track. And Curtis isn't as talented as Barry, but he's a similar style. And we had to get a play that you just can't say you have a philosophy 
and you're going to run this no matter what. If your guy isn't good at it, you're, you're nuts to even force it. But this was a kind of a deal where you have to, and it is good play against zone dogs. People crisscross inside. All it is is, is the old counter OT play without the OT blocking. It's the fullback blocking with the guard. And it's a gap, and it's a safe play, and a lot of line coaches like it because it has a lot of answers. If you do this, you do that. And it's a great play. But again, if this guy can't block a seven tick, a defensive end, you're nuts because you, you're going to sit there all day and scratch your head. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of our thinking on the play. And maybe we're screwed up. But, uh, we, got, we got more mileage out of those other two plays because our guy ran it well and our players knew where they were. He, they knew on blast where it was going. My guards would turn around, my tight end, my tackle, they turn around. Where the hell is this power play going? One time we'd tell them, oh, we're forcing it up me again. And we overcoached that Sunday. And I think the three times we ran in the game, he ran in the A gap once. You know, it's just like he sees it out there, he's going out there. So that's that's kind of what happened to us on the blast. And what happened, it helped it, um, on the power play. What helped what happened was it started to help us a little bit on our protection. And we, we would motion a guy across the defense end, and uh, Tom was at the Super Bowl, they beat the Patriots a couple of years ago, and, and they were blocking Reggie pretty good. My right tackle was hanging in there, and the third quarter, Reggie says, enough of this shit, and then he started to take my tackle and throw him into Drew Bledsoe's legs. And you, you know, you get into the situation where you work in slide protection and people are running over defense, you've lost your angles in your slide, and what, what you wind up doing is everybody's blocking five man protection and there is no angles and your slide and your turn is off. And then Reggie's having a field day. So we decided probably the best way to block Reggie is instead of putting a 310 pound tackle from Navy on him, is let Curtis Martin block him. And then, then that's the running back coach's problem. So <laughs> So what we did was, and, and it really worked, and I really, you know, it's like Pat said before, you know, we always pick up stuff, and, and I really didn't know a lot about this until Larry Kenner, our coordinator, had this protection, and, and Jimmy did it, and basically what we said was that, that defensive end has got to think about three different things. And like I said, when we shifted our tight end over on an on on under team, and we motion our fullback to that position. That guy now has two guys in his vision. He's got a tight end coming across his face. He's got a fullback coming to kick him. And his third thing is, in the protection, he's got a back in the backfield going to cut his legs. Now, instead of it, Reggie's hump move is world famous, and he knows when he's throwing it. As soon as that head goes on the outside, that guy's got his arm up, and it's, oh, shit, and you're dead. And Reggie knows where he's going to throw it just about every time. He's never going to predetermine that move. He's got to feel you, and he's going to counter you, and he's going to hump you, and you're dead, and there's nothing you can do about it. 310 pounds in midair, getting thrown into your quarterback's legs. So we said, let him come full speed, unblocked, and let the back block. And it work. And, and, and what happens is you don't let him just come straight ahead. I mean, you got to flash things in front of him. We shift the tight end across, the tight end inside releases, the fullback comes, looks like he's blocking the power play, he's got to kick him out, he bluffs, he goes to the flat, and then now Reggie's looking inside, where's that guard? So it kind of helped us, and it, and it really made my tackles feel good because they had the block. And, and, and what happens is it goes back to the old security thing. Now you truly have turn protection. There isn't a stunt they can give you. They are all these old dog people, they take the nose, they loop him here, they bring this guy here, they cross that guy. Well, it's all picked up. Against the old slide protection, as soon as it was an over defense, everybody's on a man stunt, your linebackers are coming, you've got to wrap your backs, and, and you've lost all your angles, you've lost all your zone principles, your slide principles. And we said, okay, turn protection is totally turn. There is not a defense. We're on the front side, we're going to block man on man. We are sliding everything. 
and the end man of line scrimmage is the running backs guy. Now, the way they run it, they run it a little different, and Jimmy, Jimmy will probably talk to you about their, their, their approach, and they jump the backside. And the way they did last year with, with your coordinator, they get the ball off fast. What you have to guard against is your coordinator wanting to go, go to make run seven, seven step routes out of this. Because then your running back's looking at you like you're nuts. I mean, it's got to be quick five and it's got to be gone. And, and that's kind of the area that you're attacking. You're attacking right there. Very seldom you want to do this protection and throw the ball down the field. And what happened was, we came up with current protection, and the same thing holds true. It was now a dual read, it was back to slide, and somebody gives you an under defense, okay? All right, he's across, he's making it look like power, and now, you know, it's the uncovered lineman is turning, that's the rule. We've got the bubble guy is turning from his head on back to the back side. And the back would have to go ahead and dual read one, two. Against an over defense, the back dual reads one, two, but he's looking at end first. Buck or Sam, for all the other people in the world who call him Sam, Sam second. So he's looking inside out and he's doing the one, two check. Against an under, he's got Mike to Buck and Mike to Sam. Against an over, he's got the end to the same. And everybody is slack. So give me a line stunt and we'll pick it up. Give me a line stunt versus this other one, where you're just sliding and blocking big on big. Okay. Bring a linebacker. You know, your guys, everybody's getting picked. The backs are trying to get up under. So this was the beauty of this whole deal. But the thing you got to convince your head coach, if he's the guru or your coordinator, is hey, protection first. And, and I say this about Tom all the time. I was talking about how money. First thing he did in Detroit, he was the only Sun Bishop I've ever been around. When he draws a play, a pass play up, he puts a front up. That's one thing. And very rarely, you know, five guys are out and there's no defense. And, and the first thing he said is, what's the problems in protection? And very few guys are like him, but he's, he understands our problems, so give him a shirt. Don't make him pay for it. Yeah. All right, so now we got turn protection. Now, how do you give your running back a chance so he doesn't get killed? The two things that our running back coach does is, okay, if the guy is looking inside, he's got everybody coming, and he's playing soft, don't go get him, hang. Just hang, stay inside out, and hang. If he doesn't give a shit about all that stuff crossing in front of his face and he decides that he's coming, you cut his legs. And the first thing that you'll see Reggie do is when those guys, they're protecting their legs. All right? The other thing that you do is we, we have, and it was something when I was in Canada, they ran the run and shoot screen. And, and, and basically, we ran the run and shoot screen and we tried to get a blocker out in front. If that guy's just giving you run it back in the end, we went from turn protection to turn screen. And, and what we were saying was this. We are sliding from the uncovered line. So we're turning and any stunt or any slant or pinch is picked up. Here comes the run back. He inside releases, this guy's running out, trying to get under the flat. This guy here is gonna try to knock the shit out of your running back. Our running back stepped up, he takes him and hits him with his outside shoulder and turns inside. Just like the run and shoot screen. Now the run and shoot screen used to be everybody reach in and Barry used to hug up there in the line of scrimmage. But we, we kinda had it, him off the ball because that's where he took him on, on turn protection. We didn't want to make it any obvious that there was going to be something different. So we want to make it look like turn screen. You block it with your outside shoulder, bang, and turn inside. All right, these two guys, it's really a one count. A thousand one, and he is looking from his head to back side. If the linebacker's running out, He's looking for the safety to the mic. 
if the mic, he's running to the flag, this guy's running under the spot, and the plugger gets here, he is looking for the mic to the plugger, depending on what he sees in front of him. So it's a fold block, but it's form of a slot. Boom, 1,001, pin the tackle, and go. And then that guard right now gets the goal call, and then you guys in high school and college, you can be downfield, I believe still, you can go downfield. And we had a way for a goal call. Versus an under defense, we blocked it a little different than turn protection. What we did was, if we had the loose five, the unreachable guy in the power play, that was good for us. We liked it. Because what we did was, I stepped my tackle down on air. He had Mike on the run through. Okay? He runs out of the flat, he's running to the spot route. This guy here slides over when your back goes over there. My back blocked the five technique, looked inside. My tackle on the goat call pins the mic. My center, my guard are turning, and if there's no stunts, my center folds around and he leads the ball carry. I got two shots this, one versus an over, I think, and one versus an under. What it does is, is if they're going to overplay the protection and the route, there's a big old hole right there. You can run a draw, you can run, you know, and in Indianapolis last year they ran a, a draw off of the turn kind of protection where they put the tight end on the mic. We felt like, okay, here's a chance where our back's getting hammered, back's getting hammered. Let him hammer him and then just dump the ball. A real easy throw for Drew. So we turned it into a turn, hot screen. So what I like to do is uh, maybe look at the problems that you have and show you the, uh, the results. How are we doing at times? How's it going? We're going This five can be tight, this linebacker can be stacked. Alright, and, and what happened is you wound up all the time on turn protection, you full backs out. You wind up blocking man here, which is the same problem that we talked about before. And the only slide you had was sliding out here to air, and your right guard and right tackle were winding up with all the T E stunts and the ET stunts, and they had a problem. And we, we decided to go ahead and make it a rule, if you can turn, turn. And the wider that five technique got, the tackle, by game plan, would turn. The back has to know this because if you're man blocking it, you go one, two. And if you're turning, your back's got the five technique to the buck. But a lot of times, people give you a straight over defense 
But they wind back, I think San Francisco used to when Pete was the coordinator. They kind of get into that never never land and walk the buck up. It's an over defense. And the mic stacks like that. And what happens is you wind up fanning and then everybody's inside. You've lost your angles and everybody's getting picked. So we got to the point of kind of like the power play that Pat was talking. If I got to step outside and help the tight end, that means that guy's too far. So if I have to do that on a power play, on the turn play, you turn. And that now means the back, you got that seven technique to the buck linebacker. So the only time we really wound up ever having a base block the front side and lose our angles is when they truly play like a 6-1, like a goal line, two technique, four technique, which nobody played. At the end of the year in the, in the Monday night game against Miami, they got into that alignment one time. But most people were playing that loose five technique, and we said to the tackle, we don't want to lose your angles, so turn if you can. I think you'll see it here. Okay. Uh, let me just fast forward this to uh, power play. Again, just to, to let you know, we try to set a tendency up. We shift, we motion, okay, we're gonna run power. We did that like three weeks in a row. Shift, motion, shift, motion, run power. Just so this would help us run our pass. And we really didn't give a shit about the power. We got more than three, it was a great point. But here's, here's a good example of a tackle versus the wide five. I think I'm gonna shut. Okay, this is the blast thing. Okay, here's the first one. See from the end zone. Here's a good example of how far is far. Okay, is he stepping too far? Well, yeah, he is for the run through. But my guard, he's he's thinking I'm coming around for, for Mike. Mike runs through, the, so they just switch the sides. But this is a guy who played 11 years. He kind of knows his shit pretty good, and he don't say much, but he just does the right stuff. And here's the angle. They got to loosen up. We get that inside window. So that that's our power. And again, what Pat said was we did, we did three things this year. We orange the backside where he helped the three technique, or we let this guy go right now and, and go get the plugger or the safety, depending on. I know Denver likes to bring that safety down to the weak side, so we just run him through for that one. That's kind of what we're saying. We like power to look like, okay? Then you're going to have a couple of shots of, of power versus an over defense. Okay? There it is again. Now, he's doing all right. And, and what Jimmy said last night in our meeting, you know, jam and jam, this guy is actually jamming. We try to overcoach him to jam. And then again, how do you tell him to cut it back south? Thank God for Mr. and Mrs. Martin. He was born. He, 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 he just, there ain't no coach telling him what to do. And I hear guys say, well, I wish he would have run it here. Oh, well, she you ain't. Our, my role as Barry is, none of you son of bitches ever tell Barry, you should have, could have done this. You go. You just let him run. If he's if he's making a tackle backside, we'll change your technique. But let him, if he sees that, let him go. You get into this like, oh, you know, like, I don't like, I don't know, I don't know what this guy's thinking. But all, I'm, all I know is he runs for an area. Now this is where we wanted him to run the play. This is where he winds up playing all the time. So it started working for us. I don't know, you know, maybe we get more yards. All right, tackle bubble. Okay, tackle bubble, easy release your tight end. Now, this guy feels hooked, pass him off to the fullback. 
Now, you can release him down inside and block the backside line, but the backside linebacker usually doesn't make the play. He releases him down inside, he squeezes it and forces you to bounce it. So if they're going to force us to bounce it, bounce it with the lead blocker and have the tight end out there. I'm not saying this is the best way to do it. This is what we did, and it helped us. But this guy's 245 pounds. I mean, he can go ahead and go back, but he's going to make this guy feel like one. And that helps you fullback. And again, you know, it's something that Larry had brought with him when he was with Tom Fultz. Here's, here's, here's kind of what you want to do. Okay, you got the inside guy squeezing, you got your guard coming. I tell him to trap the linebacker, put your head on the inside, trap that linebacker, run the track, and force you back in. But again, when you see this motion and the shift and this backfield stuff, this will be, in the next clip, you'll see turn protection will look the same. Okay, here's turn protection. Okay, now, inside release, so you help your back. Come across, make the motion look the same, like you're going to stop and block him out. You go to the flat. He's playing you soft, he ain't coming, stay hot. Tackle, you come down hard. Come down hard because you want to make that defensive end feel like he's unblocked, it helps the backs. Come on down hard. Help the back. If that guy squeezes with you, it helps the back. That's far enough. How far is far? There it is. Now, some guys will block turn protection, bang, bang, but then they don't have angles. Now TE's killing it. So now he's out there, loose five, we're turning it. And we're turning it to him. So once he stacks and bosses over, stay square, look for him on a straight. But that's not a killer block, and that's a defensive end. But see what he's kind of like looking? He slows himself down. Now if that was a tackle setting on him, he'd be throwing his best shit at him. And he could have killed him back there. But they don't do that. Okay. Third and one. Okay, turn 24. Okay, here comes the power. We're near backs. We're a hundred percent run. Yeah, you know, our, our our head coach wanted us to run something back here because we're over here. Well, it's, it's a good play. We don't need to run back here. It's third and one. Okay. It looks like run. It's going to be power. That's our short yardage deal. We're going to lead draw. Okay, I can give you all that lead draw. We're going to run the toss sweep over here. They ain't running nothing over here. But here's the power. Come down. Aggressive. Boom. Now, our, our receiver coach says, see that big white line? That's out of bounds. Now, you, you want to stay inside of that big white line. He's a mark, he's just like it. All right, same motion. Here comes the pop, okay? And down, boom. Now, he's coming pretty hard. I think that's Mo Lewis cut his inside leg. Okay, that's four yards. You can run the power and get three yards. So here's our game. All right, way too loud. See, see your steps we talked about stepping within yourself. He got he got to make sure he loads up that right cheek, opens that step so he can come up the field. That gets you right there. That's the problem. That's the same if you're tight end blocking down on a five technique or a tackle blocking on a three. His foot works the same as these three versus that look. Now he should get blown up. Okay, same deal. Let's see if we can. Okay, they're down inside. Uh, I, four three defense, three technique. Come on down inside. Now you're blocking one two. You think end first to the linebacker. The linebacker comes first. You take him. And, and you, you don't lose your angles. Okay, Lock, come across line of scrimmage, inside release. That saves your back from making a real hard block on a, on a pirate stunt. Okay, run him at that, try to run him at that guy, 
Widen in a little with your full back. And now, cut. <coughs> but if you start to try to throw the ball down here with this protection, you're nuts. Because your back's going to get killed. I mean, you're talking about here or here. And it is your chance for your back, you know, these two guys to blow a guy up. Three, four defense. All right, now the receiver crosses the linebacker's face. He protects. Now the fullback's coming at him from an eye, which makes it a little bit better angle to, to influence your linebacker. Now you're back. Goes ahead. He's not coming real hard. Stay high and just mirror block. Now you throw back here. But not one of these routes, you see 36 yards, 16 yards, 4 yards. Now one of these routes is down here. Everybody's catching the ball about 8 yards. And that's, as a line coach, I can block that. You, you tell me you're going to run an 8-yard route. I think I can teach that. We can hold up that wall. Okay. Now, this is the turn screen. Now, what he did was, he didn't realize it was screen, so he cut my end. But here's an example of the block. Now, if he didn't cut the end and he just chipped him with his outside shoulder, look at the lane. See the guard? He's going here. Now, just check up. You don't have to block. It's a one-man screen versus an over or under defense versus a three. All right? He's going to run out and get under the spot. All right? This guy's going to come over here for that crosser route. So now you just fold your guard around, and there's your run and shoot screen. Now, if he doesn't cut him, we got a chance. I mean, if he stays on his feet and just catches the ball, see if in the end zone is big. Come down, it looks like turn. This guy feels pinned, he wraps. Now, if Curtis just chips and looks inside, this guy here is going to have a lead blocker with the guard. See what I'm saying? You get a nice shot over here. And again, you guys, you can be downfield and call what you want. We got to give a phone call. All right, same deal. All right, now, we didn't get a guy out on this one. But here's the technique by the back. Chip, turn inside. Boom. There it is. Now, this is big. I mean, this is the kind of shit you really, you really stress. Check these two guys out here. Boom. <coughs> Boom. So, I mean, in this one here, technically, he's supposed to block down. If that guy disappears, Zephros is supposed to go and slip up. But because that guy was coming around, my center, one of these two guys got to get out. My center shouldn't chase. Right here, he should come down the line and pick up him right here. But what I'm saying, it, it, and it's no different those guys that run the run and shoot. They used to do this with the tackle and just pick back side and just bring everybody. It, but it fit our stuff. It was turn protection. Just dump it out. Now, if you've got a guy that never rushes you hard, you don't need to run this play. You can run all day. If that guy, you know, he's coming on, and you know, just unload on your back. Boom. And you just matter to him. Now you pour the back guy just like dumps it and goes. Alright. Uh, one thing I'd like to do if I've got some time, hey Bobby. Uh, we, we talked about in the running game, like I said, a couple of passes here. This is something we I do in the offseason and, and I've done it forever in New Orleans we have a million throws because we had what was called spring ball in the NFL. And we used to always have time. And, you know, everybody's out there, so you got to do something with the line. So we kind of came up with drills and inventions and some drills and stealing drills from other guys. And I just want to talk you through what we do here with our drills. And this is something that uh, it's just all this is here, it's, it's all past sets. This ain't right here. And, and basically, talking about balance, we got a strength coach, Johnny Parker. We have these air pillows. 
And my guys are taking past sets with air pillows, and, and they, it's a balance problem. I mean, these things are like little inner tubes, and they stand on them, and uh, the defensive linemen are trying to slap their hands. And we do the same stuff on two little blue air pillows where they're just sitting here. Let me just talk you through what we're trying to do here. I always try to start them on a line, and then this is the hardest line, and then all this shit is Jimmy stuff, as he told, he told me a million years ago. But what I try to do is I want to see how they're set. I got a five technique, whether I'm a tackle, three technique, a guard, or center with a one. And basically, here's a guy that does it right. Harding's right here. Okay, he was a rookie that year. And, and, and basically what you're talking about is, is the 90 degrees in your, uh, in your knee, and it's setting, and now that outside technique makes an inside move. Move your backside foot first. And the reason I do that is you can bring and trip the guy with your inside foot, and he's, he's really just working a target trip. He's working my inside target, that inside target moves, move your backside foot first, so you can go ahead and, I, the coaching point is trip him with your kneecap. See this guy here? He sets real hard outside. Santana dots in a green bay kills him. Gives him a little shake and bake outside and comes inside. Because he doesn't balance up with this foot. And you're going to see something I do with a medicine ball that will just prove me right with his balance. But I'm just trying to, like, just Jimmy, like a hundred years ago, told you, just angle in front of the knee. But I'm just telling him to just target my inside number. And I work the line with them so I can see how they all can set on me together. Again, three, back to a two, post back up. And all they're doing is working sets on air. Now, to make sure they're not guessing in the drill, go on a three technique and keep coming. These guys guess. They're going to do the drill right. But see, they're leaning heavy outside. And this guy keeps on targeting me. His hand's got to be up. So what we're saying is when you kick, that backside foot has to come back. And I got a drill for that where I put a cone in so they don't step up with that foot. Now I take the same drill and I tell them to jam with the medicine ball. This is like a 10, 15 pound medicine ball. And a Wiley has, a, I, I think, a tape with Neil Gilman that he, he invented. And this is his drill. Neil, Neil's selling these balls out here in case you want to buy some balls. But here, here's my ball how to get from Neil. But here's the deal, there's the kick, and I'm just telling him again, target, and I'm looking at his hands and his eyes, after he jams, he's, he's really on that level. That's what I'm looking for. When we watch the film afterwards, I want to see where his weight is. If he was sitting on a bar stool, he's sitting on a bar stool on his left cheek. He's got no weight on his outside. That's where if he had a bar across his back, and we were in a squat, all his weight is right there. He's not bending from the waist. He's got his shoulders back and his hands up, ready to go. This guy's a free agent for anybody who needs him. He's a hell of a technique guy. Kind of pretty good. Technique guy. There it is. Kick, slide. Again, now, again, jam. If you do something with a medicine ball, see if their technique changes. They can do it on air. If you do it now, move your backside foot first. Boom. So he's doing it right. In my opinion, that's the way I caught it. That to me is good. Okay? He might be here on his heel a little bit too much. Now I get the guy throwing a medicine ball at him. Now, this should look no different than on air. When he takes this set and he's jamming, the reason I like the medicine ball is I can see how his hands are. See how his hands are? He's in a mission his jam. Alright? Throw that medicine ball right at him, try to knock him over with the ball. So he has to jam and get his shoulders back, get a little bit of extension, but get back to bending your elbows. Don't lock him out and keep him locked. All I'm working on is the first step. The reason he's on the line, that's as far as he should step. Then he can take a balance step with the inside foot. Jam, kick, same drill, get to the line, backside foot first. There it is. Drops his hand. Free agent rookie. Boom. Okay, hands up a little bit, get your elbows down, not out. Okay, now, here's the deal. See, he sets, he's sitting on his toe. Watch him fall forward. Okay, 
And that's the same problem he has when he plays a guy who's on a wide creek, gives him a little shake, and he gets inside. He opens his inside hips up, and Santana gets him all the time. Bam. He's overset, and the guy beats him on the inside because he's so locked out, he can't make a jam and keep it away. Now, I have him take a pass set on a five technique, looking at the same set, work the same drill, and now post them up down the line. And do it on the line just so you can see if they're dropping their hands to line up, see if they're keeping a stagger, and they're not opening up their inside foot. And the reason I like to do this is, is just now, you show a guy who's done it the first time, he looks terrible. By the end of the month, if he does this all the time, he gets better. Okay, rookie, first time doing it, boom, okay. Uh, he's a terrific player. Now, I, I'm not dogging him because he gets beat on the inside move. But his balance problem is a lot because of his set. And you can see his set coming here. Okay, now you get the next ball. And there's the line. Boom. Ankle precedes the knee. Whole foot on the ground. All the shit that Jimmy's ever caught. Okay, and he jams. But what happens is sometimes you don't throw the ball. You try to dick him. Watch. See? You fake the ball. Watch his foot. He's got a problem. You got an outside shake on him. There's his set. He's heavy on his toes. He's lost balance here. And there's the problem on an inside move. So you tell the guy, you know, fuck your buddy once in a while. Don't throw the ball at him. Boom. And you got to check. He got a problem. He, right now he's grabbed. They grab his shirt. He's through. Stephen Knight used to do this. And he ripped you on the inside. Set your heart to the outside. Make you step. Overset. There's your problem. Lost his ankles and his knees, but his whole foot isn't down. He's got the, he's got the wrong legs here. This leg should be bent. This leg should be out. So you want to check your guy. So now you don't always have to do one-on-one -on -one with the defensive line because you can do it just here. Check their weight. Here's the balance. See, you got to be sitting right there. That's a perfect set. See, he doesn't time his jam. And again, just have them get a feeling of where the weight is. Make them sit on your knee. And that way, they're not leaning outside. That way, their, their weight isn't on their toe. You're sitting on a bar stool. Right there, bang. Now, here's where all their strength is. Not, not out here on this outside foot. The other thing is I do is I have them pass set with their eyes closed, and then I go around and I push it. See, he needs to take this foot and balance up. See, he's setting so hard and so out that there he is. Finally, he does it. But it should be boom, boom. He should bring this foot and get a little bit more 90 degree in the knee. Just bring this foot back. There's the right thing right there. Now, here's your tight end. We talked about the tight end. Now, this is like teaching them how to do stuff, man. I mean, this is from scratch. you got to tell them, I mean, right there. I mean, get them into the, okay, here's a kick set. But get that leg back up. And get him, I mean, get down and get on ground and, sh and make them feel what it feels like. They've never done that. All they want to do is pass catch, bring me on. They don't want to even hit the sled. Get them out here and make them align them. And then they can't, this is the only ball they work with on the two days. They don't catch their foot. See, this is what he used to do. He used to step on his toe, get leaning forward. And he was a guy from Iowa that was always in a two-point stance as a block. Forget it. But this, now, he gets the feel of the kick and bring this foot. There's some foul. Now he's got a little bit of a base. Now, he ain't a, a great pass blocker, but he, got, he understands the principles of where he has to be in his weight. If he had a bar on his shoulder, he's squatting right now. He's got some power in here. He's not out here on his toes. So those guys need it the most. Now, to make sure that they don't kick their foot up, we've got a wide technique. Guard, tackle, if you have the dual read. Sometimes these guys will kick this foot up, and they'll open their shoulders. So you put a cone right there. You have him kick. But now, see how that foot has to come back? If he kicks up, he kicks the cone. Now, I don't care about hitting this guy. I don't care about the finish of this. I'm talking about the three steps of an angle.
So if I'm talking about I'm a right tackle, I got a wide technique here, I want to get him back to a five technique. There it is right there. He's got to come up the yard and make me turn, or he's got to come and bring it to me. If I turn and open my shoulders, and the reason I open my shoulders is I, I'm kicking this foot up, or I kick this foot up, this right here teaches them their angles. One, two, three, right there. Now, walk. This guy's a lineman. He's going to run up the field. Here's the quarterback. He will find the quarterback. But if you put the cone there, it's just a little. You can see this guy. Watch. See? He, his foot wasn't tight enough for the cone. But he is swinging that leg up. And once he swings that leg up, see his shoulders? Now this guy's got the edge on him. So to force this guy to understand angles, put the cone real tight. Put it right by his heel. Make him kick back and up. This foot is back and out. This foot should be back and out. This foot should be the same kick angle as that. How do you do it? Force him to put the cone right there. And if, when the defensive lineman are brushing us in nickel, I put a, a target shirt. I put a shirt right there. So at least on film, they see where they're stepping. Just put a colored shirt down so they know where their foot is. Bobby, that's it. Anybody got any questions? I'll be glad to talk to you later. You don't have to blow with this. Thanks a lot, guys.